for all womankind to enjoy. Please welcome to the stage, Laura Haddock DiCarlo! <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I love that this is, uh, the theme is beyond barriers because our theme last year at Laura DiCarlo was breaking barriers. So bitch, we are beyond that. <laughs> <sighs> Shit, there's a lot of you. <gasps> Isn't it, it uh, wait, do I have water? And I also have cotton mouth, because I also have imposter syndrome, and I'm nervous as shit right now. <sighs> so it's an exciting time to be a woman in technology. And I don't just say that because my company designs products that help people explore their sexuality. Uh, there are so many critical issues to tackle in today's society, and among the top 10 is social inequality. The amount of change that we've seen in just the last decade is mind-boggling. We've seen increased support for LGBTQ rights, support for a woman's right to make choices about her, her own body, racial equality, and support for voting women into office. And the Me Too movement is just that, it's a movement. And even premarital sex is becoming less demonized. So much incredible change, which is finally opening the door to some crucial conversations. Conversations about human rights, equity, inclusion, shame, bodily autonomy, and a plethora of fundamental human needs. Even needs like sex. Just ask Maslow. He even says that sex is one of our most basic physiological needs alongside food and breathing. All of these crucial conversations have been propelled into view with the assistance of a vast assembly of technologies. Technologies that exist because of women like you. But I often ask myself, how the heck did I end up here? <laughs> it's not every day that you leave school and say, I'm going to be a sex tech CEO. But here I am. I was pre-med, actually, at Portland, uh, Portland State in Oregon when it happened. I had the most earth-shattering, drool-inducing orgasm I'd ever experienced. With a fling that I didn't really care to see again, so as I seized off the side of the bed, slumping onto the floor, an orgasmic bliss with one leg hitched up on top of the bed, staring at the ceiling, thinking, oh my god, how do I do that again? And I looked at him and I went, how do I do it again by myself? <laughs> <sighs> so I started looking for a product that would enable me to relive this mind-blowing experience, this blended orgasm, where you stimulate the clitoris on the outside uh, preferably with the human tongue, um, and the G-spot or Grafenberg spot on the inside with a finger mimicking a come-hither motion on the inside. So I wanted something that moved like a human partner. And I also wanted that sucker to be hands-free because, you know, free your hands, free your mind. Um, but more importantly, I wanted it to be adjustable so that it could fit me and it could fit everyone else. But guess what? That didn't exist yet. Not yet. Well, maybe now. So I started looking for the physiological data needed to engineer such a device. And I had access to medical journals, med school materials, so it shouldn't be that hard, right? Wrong. 
The data didn't exist either. So I started asking people, could you tell me where your clitoris is? How about you? Where's your G-spot? Yeah, thanks, seriously. So, I asked nearly 200 people this and realized three things. One, initially, everybody was ashamed and embarrassed, but as, as soon as they started talking, I couldn't get them to stop talking. And two, almost no one knew exactly where their pleasure points were. I had to teach people. That was awkward. <laughs> and three, everyone obviously wanted to know why I was asking them these questions. So I, when I told them my idea, everyone said, oh my God, where can I get this? Can I have it? Can I have it now? And I said, uh, I don't have it. But I still, I still had a, I, I didn't have it, but I, I, and I didn't have a plan for the data, but I did have a de design in my mind and in my notebooks. So being an entrepreneur can be a little scary sometimes because like with business, sexuality, like sexuality, there's often a lot of uncertainty, vulnerability, and the occasional anxiety to deal with. So one evening, accompanied by margaritas, a hot tub, and a couple of my close friends who knew a lot about entrepreneurship and business, I was agonizing over the dearth of technology and physiological research found in today's sexual products. One friend looks at me and says, it sounds like you should start your own business. And the other one looked at me and said, it sounds like you have an invention. And I said, no. I am not a businesswoman, and I am not an inventor. I'm a nurse. But if I was an inventor, this is exactly what I would do. And I told them this idea that had been brewing in my mind. And then I started talking about why a product like this was important. How something as innocuous as a well-designed tool for sexual exploration could spark curiosity and begin to tackle the shame and stigma that is wrapped around sexuality and therein, identity. If only I could help just a few people feel comfortable in their own skin. Imagine the great things that they could go out and do in turn. When I finished, they gaped at me and they, at each other and then they burst, you do this, then we'll help you find funding. We need to do this. This needs to happen and I laughed, but the seed had actually been planted so the only problem is that I was terrified, absolutely terrified of failure, and I could not get out of my own way. So they kept bugging me for a pitch deck, and I would just groan. I didn't even know what a pitch deck was, and I was embarrassed at my own perceived inadequacy. So in the face of fear, I did nothing. After months of stewing on this idea and not taking any action, for fear of failure, the same friend says, just show me how it works. So frustrated, very frustrated, I talked them through the whole concept using a whiteboard that I had bought because I was going to do all this great brainstorming on this whiteboard that I never fucking did. <laughs> and it was while I was telling them about this product that I realized the way that I described the problem and the solution to my friends was naturally the way that someone was going to pitch the idea for a company. And I knew what the problem was to solve, I knew what I needed to do to solve it, and I knew that I was addressing a fundamental human need. And beyond that, there was nothing in the marketplace that was already addressing this problem. So I looked up after my rant and I realized that my friend was grinning ear to ear. And I said, why are you smiling like that? And he said, because that was a pitch. I said, oh, well, I guess that means we're starting a company. <laughs> so we founded the company two weeks later, and I began to realize that I had no idea how hard entrepreneurship really was. And it's like that for a lot of entrepreneurs these days. 
There's more competition for capital and increased investor expectations, such as seed stage dilution, which has exploded in size and in number in the last seven years. We deal with outdated valuation models and approaches. The market value approach is a standard method of valuation, and it's done by comparing the company with other companies that have been sold in the market. What this doesn't account for is a company's social mission or its purpose. Despite the evidence that the influence of purpose has on organizations. Yet while we face many of the same issues that entrepreneurs faced, the double standard is even more staggering in, for femtech. Even despite the numbers, the femtech industry is scheduled to consume a healthy chunk of the wellness tech mar market by 50 billion by 2025. 50 billion. But sex is still bad. Yet still, we're brushed off or we're flat out censored. Most recently, we saw an ad by Freedom Mom that was rejected by the Oscars because apparently new motherhood is just too graphic. Seriously? But erectile dysfunction gets a pass year after year. This was in the New York City subway. In my particular field, there's an especially high concentration of divisiveness, intolerance, especially when we're dealing with something as potent as femme sexuality. Trusted institutions like medical schools, scientific research organizations, and universities have not devoted resources to understanding and educating specifically about specifically female sexuality. And I found that out firsthand. Lots of entrepreneurs are just left to figure this out on our own. Under a cloud of uncertainty or shame. But often when we do figure it out, it can often be seen as threatening to the status quo or even branded as obscene. Shortly after founding Laura DiCarlo, I headed to Oregon State University to meet with Dr. John Parmigiani, Director of Industry Research at the College of Engineering at OSU. The day that I met with him, the first words that fell out of my mouth were, so I had this crazy blended orgasm and I want to make something that recreates the experience. <laughs> and his face just... <laughs> and he turned bright red. But then I handed him a spec sheet with 52 functional engineering requirements and his whole demeanor changed. And he got really excited because that's engineering. So we started an industry funded research program funded by Laura DiCarlo the next month. Laura, uh, nine months later, we actually had a prototype and five patents produced by our almost entirely femme facing engineering team. So we took our... <laughs> So we took our little micro-robotic innovative marvel and we decided to shoot for the moon. We applied for an honorary innovations award in the, in the robotics category at the Consumer Electronics Show. CES is the international hot seat for innovation. And if you want to be anybody in consumer technology, you best start there. A CES award could put us on the map and just in time for us to launch our product a year later. So our tiny woman-led team of six applied. And you know what? We won. We thought, we thought the tides were turning for women in technology and that the taboo around sexuality was dissolving. <laughs> Yet a month later, they told us they were taking our award away. And they called our innovation profane, immoral, and obscene. Obscene. I'm sorry, but we thought that female sexuality was sacred. So we implored them to reconsider pointing out the decades of gender bias, the booth babes. There was VR porn for men on the, exhibiting on the show floor, but we're obscene. 
The fact that there wasn't a single, not one, a single keynote speaker in 2017 or 2018 that identified as female, not one, for two years. Do you have any idea how big this show is? There's almost 200,000 attendees, not one female keynote speaker. So this was not a good time for them to be overly patriarchal, yet they refused to give our award back. So we took the story to the press, and on the very first day of CES, the overwhelming amount of support we garnered completely changed the trajectory of our company in a way that that award never alone never would have. And it was through this process. Thank you. And it was through this process that we discovered something about ourselves. We found our purpose. And so we resolved to truly live by our values of respect, empowerment, and integrity, especially in the face of uncertainty and fear. Because when you make a decision based on your values, that decision will always be the right decision. And fear and shame have no power to stifle that process. So my company challenges people to ask themselves, who owns your pleasure? And there's a parallel challenge for us as women and femmes in tech and business. Who owns your purpose? Thankfully, there is a significant rise of women in leadership, more and more forums where we can all come together and support each other's purpose. And this conference is just another wonderful example of that in action. Thank you. But by no means does it mean it's time to take a victory lap. Nope. We all face a number of extremely challenging obstacles as female entrepreneurs and technologists. And the struggle is real. Founding a tech company that supports sexual wellness has a unique set of challenges. After all, our focus is on a universal human need. In fact, it's such a fundamental human need that it goes back to prehistoric days. Did you know that the oldest known dildo is actually 28,000 years old? <laughs> Compare that to the wheel. It's 3,500 years old. <laughs> We've been doing this for a long time. So initially, I thought sex sells, right? This shouldn't be too hard. <laughs> Not exactly. <laughs> There were enormous difficulties in expressing the value of innovating an industry that had not seen significant technological development in a century. In addition to that, female pleasure is highly stigmatized and misunderstood. You'd be amazed at the kind of objections that we've heard. My favorite one was, isn't it just another vibrator? No. Most vibrators vibrate. And, we only, and they only have about 20 to 50 parts in total. And our first product, Osei, mimics the movements of a human partner and boasts 250 parts inside this. Does that sound like just another vibrator to you? Now, Osei was built by a female-dominated team of engineers who have worked in partnership with Oregon State University's College of Engineering, home of the top four robotics graduate program in the United States. And together, we designed a micro-robotic functions to create biomimetic movement as stimulation, not vibration. In fact, vibrators weren't designed for female pleasure at all. Vibrators were actually meant to quell female sexuality, not explore it. Vibrators were invented in the 1880s to treat hysteria in women. Yes, before that, these poor physicians were using their hands to elicit orgasms, or what they actually referred to as hysterical paroxysm. So that's when Dr. Mortimer Granville invented the hand labor saving vibrator. I can only imagine how bad his carpal tunnel must have been. <laughs> this isn't only a gap in purpose. In a, oh, this isn't only a gap in knowledge. This is a fundamental gap in purpose. And when you discover a mismatch in purpose, you discover market opportunity. You remember those savvy entrepreneur friends of mine in the hot tub? They knew exactly what I had stumbled on. 
purpose-driven market opportunity. And another obstacle we face is the ignorance and lack of knowledge when it comes to sexual wellness. To be honest, the total lack of research is just surprising. You remember those 200 people who I had to ask about their measurements? Yeah, I remember getting a call from one of my girlfriends from Seattle saying, all right, Laura, I'm finally, I finally found a freaking ruler and now I'm in the bathroom naked, so what did you want me to do? <laughs> and I said, oh, great, just FaceTime me and I'll know, ah, no, no, don't FaceTime me. I'll just, I'll talk you through it. But she wasn't alone. We actually found that when we surveyed 1,500 people, we found that 78% of <clears throat> hetero women could easily locate their clitoris, compared to 84% of, of women in the LGBTQ community. And only 43% could cons confidently find their G-spot, compared to a slightly higher 50% of LGBTQ folks. So sometimes, sometimes we come across VCs or potential sources of funding that have these really ego-driven agendas versus altruistic agendas. And when I say that, I mean that these folks were really concerned in the, what's in it for me? Instead of the, what's in it for all of us? So that's actually been a long accepted as the norm. And, but when Heidi Zack, the founder of Third Love, which is an app-powered bra company that provides a range of realistically sized bras, uh, pitched to a male-dominated panel, sorry, pitched to a male-dominated panel of venture capitalists, she found herself being gaslit. At the end of the meeting, one man stood up saying, I'm sorry, but we only invest in businesses we understand. <laughs> Excuse me? Your firm invests in blockchain and data analytics, among other things, and you only invest in things that you understand? <laughs> yeah. So, by the way, Third Love, that bra company, just closed another round. They raised $55 million, reaching a $750 million valuation. That's almost a unicorn. So occasionally we come across our own gaslighting and the obsolete patriarchal perspective to sexual wellness. You would be amazed at how many men don't think that the G-spot exists. Seriously, really, in the 21st century? I loved, I loved listening to, to mansplaining about how women's bodies and pleasure really works. That was fun. <sighs> You'd think that they all knew what they were doing. But if you know, you know, if you know what I mean. Um, but last November, when we launched our pre-sale for our first product, Osei, we discovered that that wasn't exactly the purpose, or it wasn't exactly the case. Because by week eight after our launch, we had sold 14,000 Oseys internationally. But these men know what they're doing. I'm guessing that these are the same guys that don't ask for directions either. I told you I had cotton mouth. Do you hear me? I sound like fucking Kermit the Frog. <laughs> oh. So that's why it's critically important that, people, that the people giving you money aren't just buying into your product or your profit, but they're buying into your purpose as well. Can you imagine what goods and services would look like if these gatekeepers had an altruistic agenda? When we conducted that study with over 1,500 people with vaginas, we asked them every question we could think of because we wanted to know what the real problems were. And you know what we found? 50% of them owned a sexual device, and 17% of them were looking to buy one in the future. That's a pretty big market. I mean, seriously. But what was more intriguing is that 33% of them... Did I go back? 33% of them said that they weren't interested. So we asked them why. But before I tell you why, I want to ask you all. I want you to take your phones out. I'm going to do the flashlight thing again. That would be fun. 
Okay, get your flashlight ready. Ready? So, don't turn it on yet. Okay. So, if the answer is yes, I want you to turn the flashlight, your flashlight on. So, how many of you have ever bought a sex product? It's getting bright in here. How many of you, keep them up, keep them up. Yeah, I'm going to call you out on this. You're my favorite people. How many of you have ever thought about buying a sex product? Come on. You know you're, you know you're thinking about it. Come on. Okay, now how many of you, well, keep them up, one more. How many of you are embarrassed that I just asked you about sex toys? Oh, this is awesome. I didn't see that coming. How about you put your, put your flashlights down? That's awesome. So you're not alone. Almost 70% of those claiming to be uninterested said it was because they thought that their partner might not approve or they didn't know how to use these products or they were just flat out ashamed or embarrassed. Shame. Shame. You know what that tells me? That there's a gap in education. That there is a gap in purpose. That is market opportunity. That brings up another enormous challenge. Proving that our purpose will lead to profit. And the reality is the burden of proof of a startup is already high. And in our space as fem folks and technologists, it's even higher. While venture capital going to all female founding teams is at an all time high of 3.3 billion, it is still only represents 2.8% of all capital invested in women led startups. So when Nine in 10 startups fail. It's the founder's job to convince investors that you are the unicorn. But more than that, it's our job to believe that we are those unicorns. So there are days when that kind of faith is hard. And on top of that, the burden of proof is even higher for a woman with a particularly transformative idea that threatens the status quo. Innovation has always been met with incredible pushback. But if we're not challenging the status quo, we're not really disrupting, are we? Did anybody have any idea what we were really in for when the Apple first launched its failed Newton, the predecessor to the iPhone, in 93? Or when Larry Page's student web crawler first began exploring the internet back in 1996? Did anyone have any, any think that disrupting pantyhose could lead to a billion dollar company? Sarah Blakely was agonizing over panty lines with her white trousers when she headed to a party one evening. And she had a simple and brilliant idea. She cut the feet off of some panty, of control top pantyhose and wore them uh, to the party. She had never taken a business class and she had $5,000 in the bank. And she replaced pantyhose when no one ever felt the need to do so. So now Spanx is a unicorn. Disruption isn't something that's seen as obvious the first time it's introduced. In fact, Howard Aiken, Amer uh, Howard Aiken, the American physicist and original conceptual designer behind IBM's Harvard Mark I computer, said, don't worry about people trying to steal your idea. If it's original, you'll, you'll have to ram it down their throats. <laughs> oh, you guys are... That's wrong. <laughs> I didn't even think about that until you laughed at it. So we can overcome all of these, these barriers if we start with the biggest obstacles we face, which are the ones that we create for ourselves, our own mindset. Truly the biggest barriers for us as entrepreneurs and femme technologists is to overcome the most personal ones, gender bias, shame, doubting our own approach, imposter syndrome, and in a word, fear. When we were first getting Laura to Color started, I remember feeling terrified and I thought there's no way I could do this and that I and that even when I was prepared, I felt like I wasn't. And I had that imposter syndrome, the, that feeling of chronic self-doubt, like somebody else was gonna find out that I actually didn't know like what I was doing. Like right now, this is my first keynote ever. <laughs> so I would sit back and not take action for fear of failure. So one, in, one evening at an investor conference, weeks after performing the company, my partner kept prodding me to go pitch the idea to some folks so that we could get mechanical engineers for the project. And I looked at these two men in suits across the room and I froze and I said, no, they look so confident and important 
they're just going to laugh at me. And he looked at me incredulously and said, you know what you're doing better than anybody in the room. I've seen you talk about things that would make most people crawl into their shells. So you've got this. Anyway, remember that little thing I told you? Just just say the, the business savvy term min minimum viable product and they'll think you're brilliant. Trust me. So I walked over to these two intimi intimidating suits and within a minute, I had them and others my captive were my captive audience. So I got a little cocky, cocky and I wrapped up my pitch with, now I'm just looking to assemble the right team to help me get to <clears throat> a minimum viable product. <laughs> and they looked at each other. <laughs> we actually know a guy. <laughs> He's called the prototype guy. And I was like, you do? I mean, <clears throat> yeah, of course. Can you put me in touch with him? And the prototype guy ended up being Dr. John Parmigiani at Oregon State University. And I almost missed that opportunity due to fear and shame. In other words, our biggest challenge as disruptors is not only the mindset of the people that we are trying to pitch to, but our own personal mindset. What we're missing from this modern business mindset are some fundamental principles. Curiosity, empathy, integrity, and a, an altruistic approach to business. Curiosity means that strong desire. I'm almost done here. I promise. <laughs> I have like four minutes. Uh, no, no, not even that. You said. You know, <laughs> this is like my conclusion. I'm so God. I told you it was my first time. <laughs> Though. So curiosity is that strong desire to learn and grow more. But if we're to grow together, we must be inclusive because when you encourage all kinds of people to come to the table and innovate, you make solutions for everyone. Integrity is that self-awareness or introspection just to be truly honest with ourselves and each other. We all have our biases, myself included. And it's critically be critical to become aware of them. Empathy is making sure that those biases stay out of the equation so that we can see the world from someone else's viewpoint. And altruism. That's the only way that you're gonna discover your purpose and find your passion and stay true to them as your journey as a professional takes you through all kinds of unexpected journeys. So it started, it started when I, I <laughs> it was when I started sharing my ideas and stories and, with others that I realized that it wasn't ever about me. It was actually all about all of us. And if I wanted to change the world, I couldn't do, to, do it alone. We needed to embrace diverse passions, preferences, and anatomies, regardless of gender and I identity and expression, sexuality, ethnicity, age, relationships, status, disability, or socioeconomic status. Because when we can all contribute, we are all able to solve problems that impact everyone. That's when we found our purpose, to strive to help everybody feel a little more comfortable in their skin, in their sexuality. So, one of the biggest shifts we must embrace is how we, how we build trust with each other. One of the most widespread mo models for building trust in business, in the business setting, is the trust equation by David Meister. It's a formula that's very simple. It's credibility plus reliability plus intimacy, all divided by self-orientation, results in trustworthiness, or how can I get somebody to trust me? The model was revolutionary for its time. Though it was merely 20 years ago, a lot has changed. Look at what each element focuses on. Credibility, what are my qualifications? Reliability, what are my actions? Intimacy, what are my intentions and self-orientation? How focused am I on myself? So notice how this model is one directional. It's very focused on self and ego. And it's time to embrace a shared purpose. Let's look at a more inclusive approach. My altruistic agenda or how we can all trust one another. Let's change our focus. Rather than credibility, let's focus on curiosity and what we can learn. Instead of reliability, we focus on integrity and how we can manifest our shared purpose. Rather than intimacy, we focus on empathy and how we can be aware of the feelings, needs, and thinking of others. And while social orientation is a relevant contrast in this model, let's go deeper to the root of what's canceling out our greatness shame and fear. Let's explore what's getting in the way of our connection with others. You remember when we decided to take a stand against the Consumer Electronics Association? We went on to become an overnight sensation in business, standing up against gender bias in tech and promoting the importance of female sexuality. We were covered in almost 800 articles and I became a motivational speaker, something of what, overnight. Woo.
And then when CES, when we realized CES might be giving us back our award, we sat down with the CTA and said, let's do something better. Let's make change for everyone. So we went through and we actually, we went through and we actually talked to them about bringing sex tech back to the show. And they asked if they could make sex tech its own section. And we said no, because sexual, se human, bleh. <laughs> because sexual health and wellness is health and wellness. So let's take the opportunity to make true change for all. And so they actually allowed it to be completely dispersed throughout the entire electronic show. And they announced that last June. And then we got ready to launch OSE again, and we caught fire again. We had a lofty startup goal of a million dollars and a stretch goal of 1.5 for the entire year 2019. And we hit our goal of a million dollars in five hours. And then it went on to total at three million before the end of 2019. Uh, yeah. I'm so sorry to say we are out of time. Okay. You are Can amazing. I go through the last ones. It's so we did this, <laughs> and then everybody got to go to the show. And these are some things you're never going to know about. You're never going to know why. This is really cool. But I wanted to ask you these three questions, or four questions. What's the relationship between your purpose and your profit? And how could you, empowering your industry benefit you more than trying to dominate it? And as a leader, how can you operationalize curiosity, altruism through curiosity, integrity, and empathy? And how are shame and fear impacting your career and your company, your industry, and your dreams? And what would it be like if you could get rid of all of that? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much.